In part one of this presentation, we have been discussing the word line as it appears in Psalm 19. Their line has gone out through all the earth. And about two days after I posted the, the first part, I realized there is a line in the sky indicative of this line mentioned here. In the previous part, we learned that the word kav, kuf vav, is a chord and a measuring line. The verb related to it is kava, and the, the mikvah is the gathering of waters and the gathering of the people. And the, both mikvah and tikvah are translated as hope. We also found the mathematical constants of pi and phi in Solomon's labor. The piece of Psalm 19 starts off the heavens declare, so of course the stuff is in the heavens, but there is an actual asterism, a group of stars, which is this line. It is a line that ties the tails of the two fish of Pisces together. The uh, classical Greek and Roman mythology associated with Pisces is that uh, Venus and Cupid, or in the other version, Aphrodite and Eros, were being chased by a monster. And so they uh, tossed themselves into the sea and turned themselves into fish, but they tied themselves together so that they uh, would not be separated. We see that one fish is swimming in a crosswise direction and the other fish is swimming toward the north. And we can um, make a conclusion that these are two different types of personalities. One person is headed in a worldly direction and the other person is headed in a spiritual direction. And we'll see more about that. The star, which is the alpha star of the constellation Pisces, is called Alrisha, and it means the rope. It is a double star. The two stars orbit around a common center of gravity, and it takes 720 years for them to orbit each other. But to our eye, when we look at them, even through a telescope, you have to be uh, very focused to see that they are two stars. In fact, the distance between the two stars is about the distance between our Sun and Pluto. There are uh, three other stars. The Epsilon star is called Cot, which also means cord. The Delta star is called Lintium, which also means cord. And the uh, uh, Omicron star is called Torcular, which means thread. The uh, Eta star, which is actually the brightest star in the constellation, is called Kulat Nunu, although I would not guarantee anything about my Babylonian <laughs> pronunciation. But Kulat is the uh, cord. It's either a bucket or a cord that ties the fish together. And Nunu, in fact, means fish. We have a cognate for this in Hebrew. This uh, picture here is the original Paleo-Hebrew Nun, and it's like a little tadpole fish swimming along. The idea behind it is that it continues on and on from generation, the idea of moving and also the idea of reproduction from generation to generation into eternity. Uh, Psalm 72, 17, his name shall endure forever, his name shall be continued as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him, all nations shall call him blessed. And that word there is ye known, it's a verb derived from the letter nun, and the meaning of nun, and uh, the rabbis actually say that ye known is another name for Messiah here. Two other words that come from this letter, Proverbs 29, 21, he that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at length. So it's another verb that means to become a son. And in Job 18, 19, he shall neither have son nor nephew among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. And this word is nin. It's a cognate word, and it means son. Now, the Jewish people have always considered 
the Jews to be like fishes. And it partly comes from this verse in Genesis 48:16. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my father is Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. You can only see this actually in the Hebrew, that that verb there, let them grow, is not a normal word for growing or multiplying, but it comes from the word, the Hebrew word for fish, which is dog. And so they make a verb out of it, which is very easy to do in Hebrew. And so they will grow like fish in the earth. Uh, you can take a note, probably you already know that this is the blessing that Jacob makes on Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, that they will grow like fish in the earth. So it is taught that a Jew is like a fish in the water. He must remain in the water in order to live. The water around him is his life, and the Jew should stay in the atmosphere of Torah. It says, uh, on his word he shall meditate day and night. There's a story of a young man who comes to a rabbi and says, uh, I would like to study Greek learning now. And the rabbi says, I see. Uh, have you studied the uh, five books of Moses? He said, yes, he knows those. And what about the prophets? Yes, he knows those. And has he studied the Talmud? Yes, he knows all of that. And the rabbi says, very good. If you can find a time which is neither day nor night, in that time you may study Greek learning. Fish also have their eyes open all the time, and sometimes they need to swim upstream. In the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva compares to a Jew without Torah to be like a fish out of water. At one time, the Roman Empire made a decree that the Jews could not study Torah. Papas ben Yehuda discovered Rabbi Akiva gathering congregations together and teaching Torah in public. He said, Akiva, are you not afraid of the government? Akiva replied, I will give you a parable. To what can our situation be compared? To a fox walking on a bank of a river who saw a fish in the water darting from place to pay, place. He asked the fish, why are you fleeing? The fish replied, because of the nets that the people use to catch us. So the fox said, would you like to come up with me on dry land? You and I will live together just as your fathers lived with mine. The fish said, are you the one that is such a clever animal? You are not clever, you are a fool. If we are afraid here where we live, in the water, how much more would we be in a place where we will definitely die. Later, they uh, captured Akiva and they imprisoned him. Then they captured Papas ben Yehuda as well and they placed him in the same cell. Rabbi Akiva said to him, Papas, what brings you here? And Papas replied, Happy are you, Akiva, who was captured over the words of the Torah, and woe is me who is captured over vain foolishness kind of interesting that this is a symbol uh, adopted by the early believers for many reasons. Now it happens that the constellation of Pisces is associated with the month of Adar. It's the, uh, the twelfth month of the biblical calendar, the month before Passover. And this is the time of when Purim takes place. We can sort of look at Mordechai and Esther Mordechai is the Jew. He's surrounded in Torah. He keeps himself uh, in the atmosphere of Torah. And Esther is uh, nothing, not to speak about her spirituality, but she does go into the king's palace um, without telling anyone, according to her uncle's advice, that she is a Jew. And so she is more pursuing maybe the worldly course and maybe he's pursuing more of the spiritual course. But they are tied together as the fishes are tied together. Towards the end of the story of Esther, uh, after the Jews have their victory, we see in chapter 8, verse 17, in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, 
for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. This is a word, mit um, yahadim, that appears only one time in any form in the entire Tanakh. And it has a closer idea of joining themselves to the Jews than actually an idea like we might have of conversion. They join themselves to the Jews. That's kind of interesting. If you uh, look on the internet for pictures of a scroll, uh, Esther appears in its own scroll. It is frequently in its own little case, and it pulls out like that. Uh, and they read it, and then afterwards, when they're done, they roll it back up into the case. I uh, thought this picture was quite interesting. I found it in the Jewish Encyclopedia, which was published at the beginning of the 1900s. So I don't know uh, anything more about this case. It's very unusual. But here is the scroll of Esther inside a case of a fish. Another uh, interesting thing related to the month of Adar is a uh, word idra, which means fish bone. Uh, it's marked as post-biblical Hebrew, but the origin is uh, unknown. And if uh, Klein doesn't know the origin, then I'm not going to make any guesses either. There's another story involving two fish and five loaves of bread. This story must be extremely important because it is the only story that appears in all four Gospels. In John 6, starting in verse 9, uh, there are many people, they won't be waiting to hear Yeshua talk, they've been there, maybe they're hungry, how can they feed them? And so one of the disciples says, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? We know that the time is before Passover, maybe it's between Purim and Passover, but we don't know exactly, what's an interesting timing involving two fish. And Yeshua said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, uh, showing us that it is the springtime. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Yeshua took the loaves, and when he had given thanks to the Lord, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would And continuing in verse 12, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. They had five amounts of food. Food is the word of God. There are five books of Torah. We started out with two fish. These are the two fish that are uh, swimming away from each other, but still tied together forever. They are the fish who are Hebrew fish. And the food that is left over is 12 baskets. There's enough food for 12 tribes of Israel. Going back to the picture in the sky, I would just like to have one more look at that. I would like to say that I am not a practicer of Western astrology. The idea that the time you're born totally regulates who you are in the rest of your life. But clearly the stars were set in place in the heavens for people to see the times and the seasons. And also they tell a great story. Uh, much has been written about that story, the, the Witness of the Stars, E.W. Bullinger, probably the major work on that. Just looking at this, this is, we're talking about this line that uh, runs from the tail of one fish to the tail of the other fish. One thing that's interesting is Aries, the ram, is the one who, with his, uh, his hoof, is holding down that band. So the fish can never really get away from each other. They're always going to be tied together. The other thing 
is that we can see that the band is what separates Cetus, the sea monster here, from Andromeda, the woman who is chained here. And the mythology is that for whatever reason, uh, she was condemned to death by the sea monster, but she saved by Perseus, or however that story goes. But this is the chained woman. It's the band that separates her from her death by the sea monster. Perhaps this will remind you of something. Revelation 12, 13, and 14. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now that picture that we looked at of Cetus didn't particularly look like a, a dragon or a sea serpent. But this is another uh, early rendition, maybe 16 or 1700s, and I think you can see the likeness. I'm sure there are many other ideas that we could draw out from this cove, this line in the sky, the line that holds the two fish together. While we're thinking about that, Tassimitai Nayim Al Hashemayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.